Welcome everyone to History Hour. This is the hour that we get to spend with some of your favorite historians, authors, and history content creators. I am really excited for this one. In the spirit of Thanksgiving, I thought it would be so fun to have some people that knew quite a bit about Thanksgiving, the Mayflower, and who is also descendants of one of the most important pilgrims, uh, the William Bradford. We have Aaron Bradford from Liberty Encounters. For those of you on Instagram who are not following him, uh, go give him a follow. And his father, David Bradford. Welcome to the show, guys. I am so excited to have you here. I hope you guys are ready to talk about the pilgrims today. <laughs> Always. <laughs> yes. Yes. I love your, I, I, love, yeah. I love your get up. I love that you guys are in period, like ready to talk about this. I uh, shamefully am dressed in 21st century style. So yeah. forgive me for that, but welcome everyone. Um, so we have a lot to get talk, talk about. We have a lot to talk about. Aaron, we've had you on the, uh, podcast before, uh, which was so great. And we got to talk a lot about um, Oglethorpe and some of the Georgia colony. And we're switching gears a little bit to talk about one of the first colonies, the Plymouth colony. So we're still in that colonial period, but um, introduce yourself, let people know where they can find you, where they can follow you. I know you also do your walking tours. So give the audience some of that information before we get going on this uh, journey on the Mayflower. Thank you. Well, yes, I'm based in Savannah, Georgia, and I offer a whole array of uh, programs um, in the historic district of the colonial capital of Georgia, which is Savannah. So we do one tour in the historic district that starts from the very beginning of Georgia, goes up through the War for Independence, and then we have another one that basically is Revolutionary War Savannah. We then continue the story of the experience of Georgia Patriot refugees who had to leave their state and continue the fight just down the river at the Preserve of Whitmarsh Island. Um, we also just recently started offering a Friends of French Savannah walking tour. Uh, there's a wonderful woman named Valerie Kranznow. She's with the French consulate in Rincon, just outside of Savannah. Oh, wow. And we had a member of the French parliament uh, come and visit Savannah. And so we were able to have the French tricolor, the royal banner of King Louis XVI of France, and the 13 star United States flag. And we went through Savannah and time travel can be a tricky thing, but we were able to really carry through that spirit of when the Marquis de Lafayette visited Savannah in 1825. And his visit of the 50 year anniversary of the Battle of Bunker Hill was supposed to originally last for three months throughout America, but it ended up lasting 13 months. And he wow. laid the to two monuments that we have in Savannah dedicated to General Nathaniel Green and also to Brigadier General Casimir Pulaski. So that's, we're very excited to offer that tour now as well. So uh, we're also Liberty Encounters. We do a number of uh, other educational ventures, including uh, some films. We also do the classic Nightwatch ghost tour as well. So if you ever come to Savannah, there's so much history to share, but we, with Liberty Encounters, try to share it in a living history, immersive, uh, captivating way that can inspire. That's wonderful. That is really wonderful. I The next time, as it, as I'm getting closer to the American Revolution, I'll have to have you come on and we'll have to talk a lot about uh, the Siege of Savannah and Pulaski and maybe some of the Haitians and the the French there. Because that that's that's the story that I really like a lot, especially with the Haitian scouts and troops and stuff. So that's definitely something I would love to have you come on and talk about because it Pulaski is such an interesting guy and his death was e equally as fascinating as his life. So that's definitely something we'll have to do, but we also have your father with us and you guys have a really interesting project going on right now. And I would love to hear all about that. And it has to do with the Mayflower. So, so please enlighten our audience on what you guys are working on and, and what you're hoping to get off the ground here. Yes, it's the uh, 1620 experience, uh, and you can you can find out more at this uh, 1620experience.com is a website that has uh, a film trailer and uh, uh, a pitch deck that shows you how we're doing it and all, and all the people that are involved with it. 
Uh, it's an eight-part uh, mini-series. Uh, it's 30-minute episodes, uh, so it's four hours total. And it's really, it's really to show a lot of the, or to acquaint people with a lot of the real history that really occurred, like we're going to talk about tonight, uh, mm -hmm. that most people don't know. And it's unfortunate because what happens is with that lack of information, people end up creating other types of narratives or other types of uh, conclusions about what happened and why. And um, when this, for example, when this 1619 project came out, it was just, it was so troubling to me because there was so many things that I'm just saying, well, wait a minute, where are you, where are you getting this information? Or where, what sources do you have for it? And um, knowing that most of what we learned about the pilgrims have come from the writings of William Bradford in his diary of Plymouth Plantation. And that's where he, he was considered one of the first great historians. Um, and uh, that, that diary, we didn't really get that until about uh, 19, uh, I want to say 1940s or whatever. I mean, it was one of these things that came late. So a lot of what we've learned about the pilgrims, um, what we know, come from Winslow and Bradford's accounts. But uh, it's such a different uh, story and an important story because it ties so much back to our founding and our founding fathers and what they intended for this country to be and what we were intended to be as Americans and what it meant to be an American. And it ties back to these very uh, important principles that, uh, that they embodied and they stood for. And our founders even pointed back to them as their forefathers. Look to our forefathers because they were the, they were the epitome of this sort of thing because of mm -hmm. what they went through. Um, so anyway, uh, that, that we're gonna we're trying to get that done. We've got it's an eight-part miniseries. The scripts and screenwriter are all completed their work, and we're we're trying now. We've got a director all ready to go, and we just are really uh, needing the funding to 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 get us to be able to really put it all together and get it out there. Okay, well, if you are interested in donating to the project, I'm gonna have your guys' website on the, in the description box here below. You. Um, you can go and check that out. Um, you know, you're, you're right. It, it is such a important story. And with, I think it's about 36 million Americans are descended from a passenger on the Mayflower. That is quite incredible. If, if you are watching and you are a descendant of the Mayflower, um, Type who you're you're descended from if you know that. I know a lot of people know that they are. They don't necessarily know who they are descended from. I was telling you before we went live, I I am not a descendant of any of the Mayflower passengers, but I am a descendant of John Robinson, who was a a huge part of getting them, you know, to the New World. And I am a descendant of Massasoit. So if you were like me, maybe you weren't a descendant from the Mayflower, but maybe you're a descendant of Osamequin or Massasoit uh, in the Wampanoag tribe. Um, I just find that so fascinating that that genealogy is there and that so many Americans can trace their American story to the very beginning. You know, you can't really do that with Jamestown like you can the Mayflower. So it really is such a fascinating, fascinating experience. But we are going to get into the Mayflower and we're going to deep dive into the pilgrims here. Um, and I thought you guys are the perfect people to talk about that. I know a little bit about the Mayflower, but I haven't studied it in depth. And with you guys, you know, working on this uh, mini series, you guys are perfect. You're the perfect person to clear up some of the myths, clear up some of the, you know, falsities some of the romanticized uh versions of the mayflower if you will and let's get started where does the mayflower's story start well the mayflower and pilgrim if we call it pilgrim story really begins in in the center part of england up in the osterfield area um uh, Nick Bunker referred it as the Pilgrim Quadrilateral. There's between two rivers, the Ryden and the and and, and, and right in the river, and and that whole area up there was a was really a, a hotbed for the um, getting th this rejection, I want to say, or uh, of the the Church of England and and this uh, highly ritualistic and regulated type of of religion and so much of this was on the heels of the of the uh, the reformation 
because people got the the scripture in their own in, in they could read it for themselves and they would read things and go wait a minute this what's going on here this this, this isn't matching up and what's and so when they got to uh, read it for themselves and they wanted to study it for themselves but that was illegal you weren't allowed to study it yourself you weren't allowed you had it in fact you could go to you could be imprisoned for that and back then imprisonment was almost a death sentence I mean unless you had family or friends that could take care of you, I mean, the prisons, they didn't give you three squares a day and all this sort of stuff. You had, it, it, it was a major um, attack on people to say, look, you, if, you, if you went to prison, uh, it was a, you know, you, you could really have, die there or something. So, um, yeah, that's, that's where it all started back, back there. And, and um, the, uh, the, the churches there that uh, in, Osterfield and in uh, uh, Scrooby, Scrooby Manor, which is where William Brewster, who was one of the primary, he was the first elder of the Plymouth congregation in, in, in the New World. Mm -hmm. uh, he, was, he was there. Bradford met him at a very young age up there and became very much um, uh, a young disciple of Richard Clifton, who was in Babworth and also one of the uh, early uh, pastors of the church. These were like local churches that they, they were like home churches that we think about today. For some people who who have a home church, they they it, it's a small religious community of believers that wanted to live out the New Testament church to their world in the way that the Scripture says, in the way that they wanted to be faithful um, to 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 the Word of God that they were were now exposed to, which they hadn't been in the earlier um prior to that so mm -hmm. that's really what where it all started and where it, where it kicked off i would yeah. also see that in william bradford in up Plymouth plantation you know he begins his account um describing even going back to the, the persecution of the early church uh with rome for example and with nero and with those early christians and his understanding of history and just understanding that Satan with his ancient stratagems had sought to first outwardly attack through persecution. Um, in Fox's book of Martyrs, for example, is was a very well-known book at the time that documented many of the sufferings and people being torn asunder and some of the brutal, savage um, persecution that the, the early church underwent. But then Bradford describes how when that had the opposite effect, when instead that that persecution, well then, um, Bradford says that Satan, excuse me, that Satan took him to his ancient stratagems to divide the church and work within the church to have um, the lordly and ecclesiastical powers be lorded over the lay people. So, mm -hmm. if you read his account of it, the idea that you had almost tyranny taking place, where you had these church leaders who were um, overloading men's consciences and burning them with things that were not commanded in the scripture, but rather um, it could be added to this great weight. And so there was an understanding that we need to be faithful to the word of God. Um, one of the clarion calls of the Protestant Reformation is sola scriptura. So in scripture alone, that the word of God is to be the authority. Um, and the Protestant Reformation really rejected the Pope as being the head of the church, because it's said that well, Jesus Christ is the head of the church, and the only offices that are in the Bible are elders and bishops, which are used interchangeably, and deacons. So mm -hmm. just going back to the Word of God, they sought to live that out. I just pick up on that too, because that's you know, I know when I was when I was young, and I went to a pretty good pretty good school system in Michigan, and uh, I learned that you know the Pilgrims they were persecuted and they fled England and they came to America and they lived a hard life and uh, hard, half of them died their first winter and they served as an inspiration to many. And that's yeah. what I, that's kind of what I had. And that's when I learned that not, not only was, was King James who came into, came into office, so to speak, or took over after Queen Elizabeth died uh, in, in 1600, he, he ends up becoming, they thought he was going to be very sympathetic to, to the Protestant or, or the, I want to say the, uh, yeah, it was the Protestants, uh, but also 
he wouldn't be so so much aligned with the Catholic Church, but he was. They were. They turned out to be surprised that he was not as sympathetic as they thought he was going to be. And instead of fleeing to England, uh, fleeing from England to America, they actually went to Holland and were there in Holland for ten, almost a dozen years. And it's like yeah. I I grew up going wait I didn't know that how come I never knew that well because they they actually received or uh, th their religious freedom or liberties be, uh, you know when they had left uh, when they had left England but they didn't come right here to America so then I've got thinking well I thought that's why they came to America what well, what's going on here you know it was it was a, a yeah little bit of a caused me to say well, I need to know more about this this yeah, is where I realized I was descended from you know from yeah, Wayne Bradford but boy um, um I don't know what's going on with Aaron anyway. But yeah, so Queen Elizabeth, I mean, so you have quite a lot of turmoil in England, though, with between the Catholics and then you have the new Church of England, right? right. And okay. so, which, which basically yeah. changed its allegiance from the Pope to the King or the Queen of England, which was right. also against the, the uh, Puritans or the Separatists kind of well, it's understanding interesting. right right and, and and that was the thing that uh, you know most people don't realize that you know when they hear the term puritan uh, the pilgrim and puritan they they sort of lump them together and mm -hmm. even historically from in our the time in this country they the histories get lumped together because it was only 10 years uh, 1620 is when the pilgrims arrived 1630 is when the mass migration of, of Puritans came to the Plym uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony up in Boston, which is so close to Plymouth that it really very quickly overshadowed a lot. There was, there was a lot of adjustment going on there, but they got treated historically as one kind of group of people. Mm. And it's also a little bit confusing because um, the term Puritan is, it was a derisive term. It was not a term that that they, you know, wore proud, you know, at that time, they were, they were not, they didn't walk around going, yeah, we're a Puritan church and, and mm -hmm. proud of it because it was, they were, it was, it was meant to be a derogatory term that was assigned to them by the Ecclesiastical Church of England. Um, yeah. He, uh, I don't, hopefully we can get Aaron back on here. <laughs> um, but so my understanding is King James comes to power, right? And he allows the pilgrims to go to the to the Netherlands. Is my understanding? Is well, that correct? Yeah, he 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 threatened to harry them out of England because he was not. That was his his term for it. Uh, but he was not that sympathetic with them. But mm -hmm. uh, he be thought better to have them out of our hair than than he was not he was not supportive of them, but he he wanted to get rid of them. Yeah, he was happy right. to see them go. And the Dutch were an ally at that point in time. So to have them go to the Netherlands, he what he wasn't they weren't in England, but they were still kind of under the watchful eye of England. Yeah, well, there and there were a lot of there were there were a number of other churches. The Brethren churches up in Amsterdam is where the mm -hmm. pilgrims actually first went. I mean, I say the pilgrims. I'm I'm going to use that term pilgrims, referring to those that was part of the Leiden congregation. The, there was a group that went over. These people they came from the central part of England, but they were part. They were there were some that were from uh, originally from different parts, uh, closer to the to the uh, to the sea there, mm -hmm. and. Um, when they went over, they initially went and, and stayed for a year. The first year they were in uh, Amsterdam, which is where the Brethren, um, they, it was called the Brethren uh, Church there. Uh, and that's where that's where a lot of these um, Puritans and, and, and separatists, they were called separatists because that's what distinguished them from from wanting to remain part of the Church of England and just try to reform it as best they can, which is which got got them the name, the nasty name Puritan. But then the separatists were saying, no, that this 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 can't be reformed. It's 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 beyond that. We've got to totally come apart from, as the Bible describes us, come apart from the world and to separate. And so they they were a little more. Um, 
they would call them more strict or more um, not not have, wanting anything to do with the Church of England. But that's what's what's yeah. really fascinating about that is uh, they were there with the brethren in Amsterdam, and the reason they moved to Leiden a year later was because of some of the, uh, the this group that was from up in the Scrooby area under John Robinson. They were a little not quite as uh, strict as these the, the brethren that were there in Amsterdam, and they thought they were too extreme for them. And, and there was a little bit of a fraction there, and, and they yeah. actually went went down to Leiden. John Robinson, their pastor, their lead pastor, was very well regarded. It was a university town, and he was he was a very educated man, and, and was very well respected by the uh, by the uh, clergy there in in uh, the Netherlands. So yeah, they actually had debates with um, with some of the uh, Armenian uh, pastors and stuff, and he was, so it was a, it's, it's interesting that the pilgrims get thought of as the extremists, but that there was, there was a more extreme group, and they were also in, in the low country or up in uh, Amsterdam. Well, Aaron, it's good to have you back. Sorry yeah, about good to that. See you. <laughs> I know you got cut <laughs> off right as you were, were getting going there, so I'm sorry about that. Um, we were just talking it's about the, yeah, well, we were just talking about the, the the pilgrims moving from England and how they they kind of ended up in in the Netherlands. Okay. Um, for that time now, okay. So my husband is a descendant of William Brewster, and he gets in trouble in the Netherlands, doesn't he? I, okay. I don't know if you guys know about that, but yes. he was was doing a little bit of smuggling, and. It was him, and I can't remember the other their member of the congregation that were trying to smuggle um, pilgrim pamphlets back into England, and he gets found out. Is that one of the reasons that kind of forced them to make that decision? Okay, well, we've got to leave the Netherlands. How do they make that? How do they come to that realization that you know we're here, but but we we've, we've we've got to go find something of our own. Yeah, that's an excellent question because it, uh, yes, I would say that that would have been a little bit of it because that persecution didn't totally end uh, when right. they when they were in in the Netherlands because the government still had a relationship and they were looking for help to kind of find out where these guys were because they did have a printing press mm -hmm. and they did print pamphlets and send them back into England and so that was like he was still. Kind of a little burr in the saddle under the saddle of uh, of, of uh, uh, King James, and so it wasn't totally. He did have to. In fact, when he came back to, uh, on the um, Speedwell and get hooked up with the Mayflower to come across to America, he had he had to kind of kind of not say hide his identity, but he had to be very careful about people people knowing who he was. He he still had to be a little careful being over there because he could have been very easily abducted. Yeah. So yeah, that's a little bit of part of it. But Bradford gives actually gives four very specific reasons in his of Plymouth Plantation of why they left, and it didn't have to do with with religious persecution because that wasn't the primary reason they they felt they had to leave. Um, it was a very difficult life. They were an agrarian. They were agrarian people. They were Bradford grew up on a, a farm, a farm boy basically, um, uh, and, and that's that was very good preparation for what he ultimately was doing over in, in, in America. But um, uh, it, it was, they were the low end of the totem pole. They were back break. They were in the uh, uh, fabric or, or um, textile type business. They, they, they made fabrics and they, they, they had looms in their small little houses where they were. And, and they worked long days, uh, and it was backbreaking work, and it was very, a lot of them, uh, it was, it was, I guess, I, I was trying to make an, think of an analogy. If you come here and you, you work, you're coming from another country as an immigrant to this country, and you, you, you're, you don't, you're not in the guilds, you're not in the professional uh, um society jobs you're you're the you're doing what a lot of people don't want to do and it's backbreaking work and very difficult and that's what they that was a big part of what they found themselves in but they also found themselves um uh the 12-year truce that was with spain 
that the Netherlands had was coming to an end in 1620. And, and they were going, that truce was going to be over. And they were, they were looking at that going, the religious persecution, which we've enjoyed since we got here, uh, that may be, Spain was, was Catholic, very, very much a Catholic. And they thought that's, we're going to have to go through this all again. And that was a, and they also found a lot of their children were grow, who had been grown up there now, 10 spent 10 years there, had become enculturated in a lot of the Dutch culture. And some of them had, had joined the Dutch Navy. And some of them, there were, there, there were instances of one or two that they knew about that uh, had actually done that. So, was, and they were, their children were very important to them. Bradford talks about this in his, in, 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 when he talks about his children, um, they, they were Englishmen. They were proud that they were Englishmen and they wanted them to, to have these, these values that um, not only their spiritual values, but that, that they were, that they were, they were, they were patriotic to their country as well. And their King, even though the King wasn't, didn't reciprocate, but um, so they saw that as their, their, their children um, adopting the culture of the Dutch culture and being more licentious and, walking away from the faith and that bothered them. Mm -hmm. and, it, and I think the last, and then Bradford says, and finally, uh, last but not least, was their desire to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ to the new world. He said, that's the most important thing we should be doing anyway. And so uh, those were the, comp the four main compelling reasons for them feeling that now is the time we need to, we need to move or to, or to relocate mm -hmm. and we can't do it all at once so they they took a small group of people that were going to go it was like a it was like a big church plant actually they were going to go across the ocean they were going to get get settled and they were going to bring the family later in fact bradford and his wife dorothy left their six-year-old son john behind mm -hmm. um uh so and, they, and he was going to come and he ultimately did come later but he didn't come right away um right. but uh yeah, they had thought about going to the northern coast of South America. They thought the weather was more, was really nice, they heard there, but they also heard about some um, some atrocities that had happened among the native people there. And also the weather was not, it would have been not what they were used to. And so right. they, were, they wanted, they thought better of it and decided to go to Cape, uh, toward, uh, actually around New York is where they were heading. Right. So how, um, how did they, so, okay, they want to come to the new world, but this isn't just, you just get to come. I mean, you have to set up, you have to get permission to come here to the new world. So how did they end up getting permission from the king after they have been given James so much grief and he was willing to let him just go live in, in Holland just to get out of his hair. So how did that end up happening? How did that deal get struck that gave them the license, I guess, to go and settle in the new world? It's a great, great question. Robert Cushman was a main, main influence uh, person who did a lot of the negotiating back and forth with the uh, uh, merchant adventurers. So these, they were, that was another thing that was forming now was all these, uh, companies that were pooling together to support advent, uh, um, development of plantations and settlements over in the new world. And he dealt with them and did a lot of the convincing. Winslow, though, was a very, also a very, um, very, he came, from, he was one of the wealthier and, and more influential people. And he, he was their ambassador um, throughout the time he was in America. And he actually, um, he was so influential in in going there and working out and negotiating treaties and, and, and being a very um, good ambassador to the Native American tribes that they found that they were dealing with. But then he, he doesn't stay there. Uh, later, he goes back to England and uh, because of the the revolution that's going on over in England and, uh, and he serves uh, over there in the later part of his life. Mm -hmm. and comes back and actually dies in, in Jamaica or off the coast of Jamaica somewhere. So, it's, yeah, it was. Um, but those were those were two of the influential people, and they worked through the Merchant Adventure companies. Aaron, uh, you know, want to add anything to that? Well, I'm just even thinking about this and how 
that spirit of entrepreneurship and almost like the free enterprise. In other words, where you have these different merchants who marshal their resources and band together and undertake this endeavor. Um, as Mayflower, as Mayflower Compact says, where um, for the glory of God, but also for the being patriotic for your king. And um, I'm even thinking of earlier, like right behind me, I'm sure you notice I have the, the flag of England, which has the cross of St. George on it, the patron saint of England. But how even um, not that many years earlier, when you had the mighty Spanish Armada try to take, you know, attack England, and you had a number of these smaller, faster ships. But you had Sir Francis Drake, who's known as Drake the Dragon. He was basically a government-sanctioned pirate, a privateer. And Francis Drake attacked the Spanish at St. Augustine. And so I just find it interesting in the history of England, um, especially at this time period, just how much individuals and, and even merchants band together. Because like with these privateers, they would use their own ships, use their own resources, but they had a letter of mark which gave them permission to attack other countries. But that letter of mark meant that if they were captured, they were not to be flogged and treated like a scallywag pirate, but they were to be treated more or less as prisoners of war. So if you consider colonization, then as we said, we talked really about the settlement of Georgia, the colony of Georgia, um, Oglethorpe himself spent a lot of his own money for the establishment of Georgia. I do see a similarity, whether it's from naval endeavors and also even with settlement, um, how that came about, I do find fascinating. I just do see that's a theme. I think when you, when it comes to exploration and when it comes to colonization, there's that theme of um, entrepreneurship and the theme of putting skin in the game and making a big investment, knowing that there was fraught with peril, knowing that some of these investments that people made, they lost uh, money, they lost fortune on it but they were not complacent and they did not expect someone else to come on and do it, but they had a vision and they sought to carry out that vision. So that vision that um, was just described that the pilgrims had when it comes to even looking for their posterity. Uh, I was just reading now as dad was talking about the great concern that their posterity would become degenerate and corrupted. So the idea of we can grind away here as immigrants here in Holland but if it's just hand to mouth, we're not getting anywhere. So what mm -hmm. kind of future are we building for our posterity? Um, so that forward thinking vision, I think, is another theme that we see uh, with Mayflower. And when you think about the American ideals of free enterprise and the American ideals even of um, uh, having a vision and seeking to carry it out and taking the initiative as opposed to maybe being more complacent or, or waiting for someone else to do it. I think that's another theme that you can see throughout. I think that's an important point too. To, I, I just want to comment briefly on that as well, because there is a misconception that they came over here under sort of a, a, a communal or communism because they were all working together to pay off the debt that they had had acquired. It wasn't a communist system at all. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and people often think it was until 1623 when Bradford comes out and, and makes this uh, finds people not wanting to work, all this sort of stuff. Because, but, it, and, and so he he declare, gives a plot of land to people, and, and that people look at that as the birth of free enterprise. You know, it, it came out of Cape Cod. You know, it came out of the Plymouth the Plymouth uh, plantation. But it really wasn't because it was a seven year contract of which they they worked and they they were paying back this thing. But then they also had a contract to have this um, have private private you know have their homes and the, the land that they developed was was then theirs after they had paid this back so it wasn't really a pure socialism kind of you know which or communistic type system that a lot of people today i hear that all the time it's like oh they you know they they were under that system and then then they read plymouth plantation and they realize that you know you know bradford introduce this free enterprise. And it really is a, a beautiful little segment. There's like two pages in there. He talks about it. It's, it's actually even funny the way he describes how the women, you know, went out now went willingly out into the fields with their children. And it, 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 it's, it's humorous the way he describes how successful it was. And to think that, that the, the Plato and others, uh, 
he makes comment about how they, they thought they were wiser than God. Yeah. You know, which was, yeah. Which is well, you know, of- I always kind of um, chalk that kind of up to, first of all, the, the pilgrims, they leave late in the year. Yes. They, they leave a lot later than they should have. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the fact that they, they decide to embark on this journey in September Okay, that, that is unheard of. That's something that you don't do. You right. you don't leave until the spring so you can get there in the summer and you have ample time, yes. you know, to start your harvest and get your houses built and stuff. You don't leave at the beginning of fall and get there at the beginning right. of winter. That's just a death sentence. Right. Very so, difficult. So what happens that makes them delay so late in the season to get this going. And why did they make that decision to leave in September, knowing that they were going to get there at a very inopportune time to, to create a successful settlement? I mean, yeah. I'm sure that Miles Standish and Stephen Hopkins and others who had been, you know, in the new world at some point in their life was like, okay, this, this isn't, we should delay this. What made them make that decision to leave? Yeah. It's, it's amazing. They got a crew that would go over. Uh, yeah, yeah. because of The crew better than anybody knew the terrible storms and things that would happen at that time of year, but they didn't plan to go in September. That's one mm-hmm. of the things that that was not the plan. The plan that they actually left in, in July, July 22nd is when they left with the Speedwell was the ship that they had that they had purchased uh, over in in uh, in Holland. And they left Delfshaven uh, and went to Southampton over in England to hook up with or, or with the Mayflower, who was got the two ships were going to go together. And the smaller ship was going to even stay there to be their um, sort of a, a sh- fishing ship and this type of thing, uh, a smaller the smaller boat. Um and what happened is they, they left Southampton on August 5th. So they're, they're leaving to go on August 5th. It's still, it's still a month, uh, you know, it's not as, it's still not as early as they probably would have liked to have gone, but it was, it was still early. But the ship, the Speedwell took on water. Mm-hmm. And it was like they were in danger of, of sinking. And it was like we couldn't, so they had to pull in. They pulled into Dartmouth and got it fixed, or they thought they got it fixed, or worked on it, and then they left Dartmouth on August 23rd, which happens to be my birthday, that's how I can remember that, <laughs> 23rd they left, and so now they're on their merry way, and it they're, they're out into the, if, if you look along the southern coast of England, and where they were, they were getting out there, and then all of a sudden, again, it's taken on water still, so they had to pull back in, and they pulled into Dartmouth, and they spent time getting it fixed there, and um, and they went out one more time, and, and it still didn't fail. So they're thinking, you know, three strikes and you're out is kind of how you you, you tend to think about that. Mm-hmm. But um, they were they then went into Plymouth, and uh, uh, they they decided to leave the Speedwell behind and all compact together, as Bradford says. In fact, he he gives a very I could sh- I'll share it with you in his own words if you, if we have the time. I he starts out and he says it was Wednesday, September 6, and these troubles being blown over and all now compact together into one ship, we put to sea again with a prosperous wind, which continued divers days together, which was some encouragement to us. Yet according to the usual manner, many were afflicted with seasickness. And that I may not omit here a special work of God's providence. There was a proud and very profane man, one of the seamen of a lusty, able body, which made him the more haughty. And he would always be condemning our poor people in their sickness and cursing us daily with grievous execrations. And did not let to tell us that he opened to help to cast Avalus overboard before we came to our journey's end and make merry with what we had. And if he were, by any gently reproved, he would curse and swear most bitterly. But it pleased God, before we were half says over, to smite this young man with a grievous disease, of which he died in a desperate manner, and was so himself the first. 
to be thrown overboard. Thus, wow. his curses light on his own edge. And it was an astonishment to all his fellows that they, it, 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 it was an astonishment to all his fellows that they noted it to be the just end of God upon him. So it was a very, very, that was one of those powerful and, and poignant examples of what happened there because it wasn't, it wasn't the, 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 Mayf the pilgrims that were going, see, see, they, it was his fellows noted it to be the, and there, he was the only one that really, that died on that whole journey over on the Mayflower. There was one young man that once they arrived, William Button, he, he, he uh, died once they arrived, mm -hmm. but, um, uh, this this seaman was the only one who who uh, that was cursing them and <laughs> was the only one that got that actually died on the way over but yeah they actually left um plymouth then on september 6th and uh, it took 66 days to get over but the other thing a lot of people don't realize it's not like they just got on a boat and came over and then got off the boat they were stuck in plymouth or they were stuck on the east the, the coast of england for, for a couple of months there and they were using up their supplies they were actually having to eat you know and use up their butter and they actually had to sell some of the butter to uh, that they were going to take with them uh so it was getting kind of desperate and they had to sink or cut bait you know they had to decide and they they felt they needed to go over they couldn't imagine going through another year or winter what are we going to do here we have no place to go here we've got to go and we're yeah. better off making a, a go of it over there, uh, even though they, they arrived uh, in in uh, November. But they right. but they also stayed on the ship. That's the other thing. They didn't just get off the ship, and there was no place to go. No, you know, It was just a hideous desert wilderness is what they were looking at. And so they stayed on the ship after they got in Provincetown Harbor. They stayed there for another three months into the year. That's where a lot of them died from their um, sickness and stuff. It wasn't – they were – Ashore. I used to think, oh, they were probably on shore and they didn't have, you know, it was freezing and, and in the winter. No wonder they died. No, they were on the ship. <laughs> they were still on the ship a lot of them. That's where it's all happening. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's another thing that people, a lot of people don't realize. So they take that journey. They, they, they get there. They don't immediately go to Plymouth. They go to Providence. Providence. I'm sorry, what, where did they end up landing? Well, the Harbor is where they, they actually were going to head down to um, um, the Hudson River is where they were heading. And yeah. um, he says they tacked about and resolved to stand for the southward um, uh, to Hudson River um, for their Were they, were they, were they, they were trying to make it to Virginia? That was the northern parts of Virginia. You know, when you hear people okay. say they were going to Virginia, we think of the map today and we think of where Virginia is down by the Chesapeake. The northern parts of Virginia were up around the Hudson River. The Hudson, mm. that, that's where, and there was a Dutch explorer there in six, uh, 1609. Had Hudson, Henry Hudson had landed there. There was a little, and I'm sure, I assume they thought, well, there's at least, we just came from Holland. There's some Dutch people down there. There's some people we, we might be able to, you know, uh, help us as opposed right. to being on their own. They thought there would be some Dutch people that, that they, and they did, they got to, they got to meet the Dutch that were down there. They come up to Plymouth plantation. Uh, uh, they had a, there's a, a great book uh, that, that one of the, the, the explorer, um, D. Razier, I think his name was, he, he made a trip up there and he gives an account of his, of his, how nice, how well they treated him in Plymouth plantation at the plantation and stuff. And, so that was they, they did have kind of a, a connection there, a Dutch connection. <laughs> right. Yes. I want to talk about um when they get to um Providence. I want I want to talk a little bit about what happens when they land there. Because like you said, they are there for a little while. Yeah. Um why did they not settle there? Well, they they took this shallop out and made several different journeys to explore the mm -hmm. uh, Cape Cod, the, the hook there, and uh, uh, to find a suitable place. There, and if you go up there today, there's the first landing, the location where it was. But it, it was a brutal time of year. And it was, I mean, I've gone up there and I can't believe how, how windy it is. I can, I really, when there was one occasion where 
their shallop got almost destroyed because of the storm that, they would, that was blowing through there. And they ended up on Clark's Island. And they didn't know if there was going to be hostile natives there, or, uh, Native Americans there that, that would they needed to defend themselves against. But uh, there's, there's the, thankfully, there was not. There was this huge, huge rock. People think of Plymouth Rock, the little rock, and they always, they're always disappointed how small the fragment that's left is on the main coast. But you go out to Clark's Island. It's a private island, so you just can't go out there. But Pulpit Rock is this huge rock where they actually uh, had a Sabbath day. It was a Sunday, and, and the sun came out, and they dried out, and they just um, had a day of worship there. That, that was one of the first... Um, uh, um, services that they actually really had um and it was not intended they, they just it happened to turn out that way but yeah they explored around there and they found that 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 the plymouth harbor there was a a clear stream a, a, a fresh water stream that flowed out down and it was there was high ground that was cleared uh that was the other thing there were so many so many what they would call the providence of god had prepared. There was four years before there. There'd been a, a, a plague that had come down through the east um, sh um, coast there, and just wiped out about ninety percent of the native population that was there. Yeah. Uh, so much so that the native other tribes did not go back into. It was like a, a toxic waste dump. You know, we don't know it, the plague's still there. It could, you know. So it was this, and they had had farmed. They had, they had. They found baskets of corn and things that were buried in the ground. In fact, one on one occasion, they found this this um, bunch of corn in a basket that had been buried. And the next day, they had a real bad snowstorm. That had it had they not found it the day they were there and, and came across it, uh, they would have probably never found it because it would have been buried in the snow. Yeah. So there's all these little things where you just see. The, the hand of God just have paved a way and provided a place for these people to go. And it's a very unique location because the one tribe that was there was also a very spiritual tribe. Right. Isn't that interesting? You know, why not? Why wasn't it down with the Nauset or the Narragansett, who are a warlike tribe that was down further south toward Bristol and or Bristol or Rhode Island area now that were enemies of this tribe, this this Poconocet tribe or Poconocet, they call it, you know, tribe. Yeah. And that that the Massasoit Asamequin or uh, was was the head of, and he was about the same age as Bradford. I mean, they were both in their thirties. He was, but he was a, a very well respected um, chief of the Sacums that lived in that area. So all of these things just it was, and they were they were they, you you read the history books today they were blown off course right they were they were they were they they because again they were trying to go to the hudson river instead they ended up a little bit north it wasn't like they were blown half the continent away they were just a little off course but they're up north there was this place that it just seems like i don't know how you can how you could not see the providence of god just said here's the place i have for you and this is where you're going to go <laughs> this yeah. is where you're going to be and i've yeah. got it all play i've got it all prepared for you that if they had gone south they would have run into the narragansett who were who they would have had a fight on their hands and they had half their half their um, number that first year died of the sickness but they the, the ones that were left half of them were children mm -hmm. they weren't they weren't even adult I mean, they, they would have been wiped out easier than uh, it could be yeah I, there definitely is a lot of blessings that you can see from from the pilgrims you know but but those days were were also very very challenging and very difficult for them and um something that i noticed as i was reading and and i also kind of wanted to talk to you about that those first three months when william bradford he he keeps going out and they're scouting for weeks and weeks at a time his wife dorothy mm -hmm. she passes away quite suddenly, you know, he returns to the ship and he is told that she had fallen off of the ship and had perished. Yes. So there is a lot to the mystery of Dorothy. I mean, you, you've, you've read some of um, Bradford's passages. He's a very eloquent man. He, he writes very beautifully. I mean, he, he is almost poetic in his writing but yet when his wife dorothy 
has passed, he writes yeah. only a sentence or two about her, yeah, he, he says, which has he led to quite a lot of speculation on her death. So the myths, there's a lot of myths and a lot That's of romanticized. Was she having an affair with the captain? <laughs> Did she commit suicide? So no. maybe um, you can speak on that and maybe talk about some of uh, those misconceptions about yeah. around Dorothy and maybe what the life was like for the women uh, uh, that had, you know, decided to come on this voyage. As we know, Jamestown, they didn't take any women with them because of how difficult they knew it would be. But the, well, the, the Mayflower did. Yeah. And, and that was the thing that the even the native Indians uh, noticed right off the bat about them was they brought their women and children with them that was different that was that, that never happened before mm -hmm. it always been men coming to 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 take you know to fish and to tr you know trade and to do things but they were they were never there to settle and that was the right. thing that was distinctive about plymouth um but yeah the the death of dorothy was very tragic it was it was three days short of their seventh wedding anniversary so it was like one of those things where uh, he comes back and he hears about it and he, he, people yeah wonder why in the world did he say does not mention it at all mm -hmm. and i think the 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 more you i've thought about that a lot I'm, i was very curious about it and i was wondering what people have been saying about it and i actually looked into that and studied it as to why he didn't say anything about that and the best that i can come up with, the best thing that makes a lot of sense to me there's several reasons why first of all he was giving an account he was he if you read a Plymouth plantation, he's always talking in the third person, and it wasn't about him. It wasn't a personal diary. He wasn't keeping a log or a diary like we think of when, oh, what happened to me today? You know, he was always talking about you can't read a page of his journal without it saying, and it pleased God to do this. And God, the providence of God just shown here. He was he was telling people about what God was doing here. And so it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a personal thing. So that's number one. Number two was William Bradford was uniquely prepared for this this type of a job. As I, the more I look into his life, he had a, had a, an, a, was so well acquainted with death. Let's put it that way. He his father died when he was a year old, so he never really knew his dad. And so his grandfather uh, was sort of the male head of, uh, at that time. And so his grandfather dies when he's three, mm. and then. His mother gets remarried, and and then when he's seven, his mother dies. And after, so he's orphaned by the time he's seven years old. And then he, and, and if you progress throughout his life, you'll see that every three to five years, somebody very important and very significant dies in his life. Mm -hmm. His sister dies when she's 18. He's, she's like three years older than he is, and she dies just before, she didn't even get to 20. She was 19 or I think 19 or 18, and he was like 16 or whatever when his sister mm -hmm. dies, just before he leaves to come over to Holland with, with the group. And so, and, and then, you know, his wife dies. And he, and also all the people that died after that, his, you know, uh, um, John Carver dies uh, in that first spring. And he's just, death, he, he has become so acquainted, well acquainted with it. And he was also a young man that grew up very well verse from the time he was a young from the time he learned to read mm -hmm. he was in the bible he was studying the word of god he was studying under clifton and these these uh reformed preachers that were really he 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 had a genuine in fact he himself attributes um his sickness he was he became very sick and that's how he learned he didn't continue with the farm life he became he ended up going to school people are always wondering how did he learn how did he learn Greek and Latin? And this is amazing. He, he actually, it turns out, uh, Sue Allen has done, uh, uh, she's oh, an English historian and researcher of, of, um, uh, of the pilgrims. And she, she and has traced back to where, when we talked about his, his uncles that took him in, uh, when he was sick and he ended up, uh, there was a school that was not in Austria. It was over in Tick Hill. We didn't think there was any school. We, we thought, I say, people today thought there was no school in that area. Well, it turns out um, what his, not his, his dad's brother, but his dad's grandfather's brother or something. It was, it was an uncle, yes, 
uh, but it wasn't the uncle we, we assumed he was talking about and that lived over in Tick Hill, which is a, a, you could walk to. I mean, it's it's eight hours. It's a it's a few mile walk, three miles or whatever over there. And they think that now that that's where he got taken in by that uncle who lived up in that area. And he went to actually to the schools that they that school that they had there. So he probably because he was sick and couldn't work and help in the fields, he got that education. So. Uh, there's a lot of, like I said, a lot of preparation. And I think, I, I believe too very firmly that uh, Ecclesiastes was probably one of his favorite books because it really talked about the brevity of life, uh, that life is a vapor, it's a uh, hevel, you know, it's, it's the, it's a puff of smoke, a mist that's coming, it comes in, and, and that you're not promised tomorrow mm-hmm. and that you lived every day trying, you know, to, he lived the life that I think most people wish they could live because he had that sense of urgency, that sense of you're not promised tomorrow, things that you take for granted today. I think that's where he, he could be. People wonder how courageous they were, how bold they were, and how, how could they have even done all this sort of stuff? It's because they lived one day at a time and they walked with God, looking for God's pr- provision and God's protection and God's this they, they, that's why that's why our founding fathers looked back to them and said these are the people faith freedom and virtue are those three essential ingredients for a self-governing nation to work that's what our mm-hmm. that's what, uh, Washington Franklin uh, all the all the founders that were Adams talked about you know are this 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 republic was meant for a moral and religious people. It's totally unfit for the governance of any other because you've got to, you've got to realize you're accountable to an authority higher than yourself or your constituents and what what we all want from it. And and I think the pilgrims embodied faith. They embodied freedom because they they all they went through to to be to be able to live their faith and and and, and the Mayflower Compact. You know they were the architects of this first ever in the history of the world. They wrote this. Mayflower Compact that yeah, I wouldn't be accountable to each other. I want to, um, yeah, I, I, I want to talk about that because, you know, the the, Const- <laughs> the Declaration of Independence Constitution, it, it very much has its roots um, centered from a few historical documents, right? When I was in college, when I was in class, we did a, a, a study on you know, where that idea came from. And a lot of it came from the Magna Carta, but much of it came from the Mayflower Compact. And the way that that came about is also very interesting. So why did that have to be made? Who came up with that? What was the circumstances around them agreeing to this Mayflower Compact. And I think what 41 of the 41, I think. 41 signers. Then, there were 41 signed, signers. That's correct. Yes, yeah, sign sign the Mayflower Compact. Mm-hmm. So who were they and what was this agreement? Well, Aaron, I'm doing all the talking here. Uh, we got we got the saints and strangers here that they came <laughs> across and the strangers were uh, were talking about leaving. They were going to just go go off by themselves and leave this little church plant people who have all these children and, and women uh, that they were going to just, and he, they knew that this was, we're going to perish. If you don't stay with us, we're going to perish. So they, um, yeah, I can, I can tell you, I can give you another little right. excerpt of what Bradford said about it very quickly. He, he said, um, well, go ahead, go, what, go ahead, Aaron. What, what were you going to say? Well, I, I guess to just, Set stage real quick is just how they were going way off course. Originally, they were planning to go towards <clears throat> closer to where New York City is today, mm-hmm. um, but yet because of the fearful storms at sea, it pushed them way farther north than they originally had planned to go. So, as opposed to being in the northern parts of Virginia, I believe some of the strangers they were referred to said, "Well, wait a minute, your this agreement." no longer holds any weight because we've been blown so far to the north. So the situation has changed. So yes, in dire um, circumstances that they're facing, but also even contesting the original parameters, saying that it's null and void because we've been blown way off course. So I think that's also was a factor in as well. 
So it was yeah. certainly a, a make or break moment that had things gone according to plan, they would have never got in such a dire situation. But my understanding is because they're going so far north, of course, and then arriving so much later that it forced them to really either band together or to go separately. Yeah. And we can be very grateful um, that they did decide to band together. And I also think it's remarkable too, um, just the number of people out of the 102 passengers who signed 41 out of 102. Um, that's a pretty fair amount, but then considering the context of the time, uh, I mean, that's one thing that I usually remark about even coming back to Georgia. It's like the, the tradition is when the firstborn, excuse me, the parents died, the firstborn son gets the land. He gets inheritance. So you go from that, but in Georgia, the head, every head of the household gets 50 acres of land. So there's still a recognition of um, heads of households and the idea of even representative government, as it were. The idea is that you have heads of households that represent their household, which might include indentured servants, might include servants, might include um, wives and children. It, there's one representative for each household. So I think we can even see with that number of signers, um, that there was a lot of participation and representation. But the representation was structure of you have heads of household representing each household. And so for the heads of the household to sign that. Okay. So again, putting in context, I think it is a pretty remarkable amount of representation um, for there to be a voluntary agreement to combine together Right, reads almost the preamble to the United States Constitution, you know, for the general welfare, the idea that it's in our mutual best interest to come together and to submit to that, to submit to that civil authority. So whether you're saints, whether you're strangers, whether you're part of that church, ch church congregation or not, there's a recognition that we're part of this community. And so I think even when we talk about faith and family and freedom, that with faith, Family is the idea of, so it's not just maybe your nuclear family, but heads of household, the idea that your family is part of a community. And there's such an emphasis placed on it and such a recognition of it. Um, I guess one other thing I'll share real briefly is that um, just the, the understanding by, uh, by the reformers is that there are three types of government. Mm -hmm. You have family government, which was instituted by God. You have church government which of course had a lot of contention over it, what that looks like, but then you have civil government, um, civil magistrates, so governors and the like. Um, but these are each distinct jurisdictions and these are each governments that are ordained by God. And yes, you have overlap, but they're all under the authority of God. So I think even with something like the Mayflower Compact, there's a recognition of um, jurisdiction. And I think that's another important theme whenever we look at history, right, is the theme of jurisdiction and where does that authority come from? And then how is that authority um, interfacing with other spheres of authority as well? So, yeah, yeah I think I think your question, Lisa, is, is a very good one. And I think Bradford answered it very, very succinctly right before he gave or he recorded what the Mayflower Compact, that what they had agreed to. Um, he said, I shall uh, begin to uh, return back and begin with a combination. He called it a combination. He didn't call it a compact. It was a combination or an agreement, a combination um, uh, made by, by, uh, by us bef before we came ashore, being the first foundation of our government in this place, occasioned partly by the discontented and mutinous speeches that some of the strangers amongst us let fall from them in the ship, that when they came ashore, they would use their own liberty, for none had power to command them. The patent we had being for Virginia, not for New England, which belonged to another government, of which the Virginia Company had nothing to do. And partly, that such an act by us done, and this our condition considered, might be as firm as any patent. And then he goes on to say, the patent said, you know, in the... In, in, in the name of God, Amen. He he goes through and and lays out what the 
what the compact was written, but there was also some interesting things that you talk about Robinson, you talk about um, uh, some of the other, uh, uh, Hop, Stephen Hopkins, that you can see where a lot of that language had, had come from because it had been, they'd been talking about these things back in Holland or back in mm -hmm. Leiden. Uh, and so it wasn't a, it wasn't like they just came up with something new and different. It was like, this was built on things they had been talking about, been, been working through and thinking through and um, when trying to live out for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they, um, uh, I, I think the Mayflower Compact is probably one of the most understated contributions that the, the pilgrims have made to, to uh, the founding of America, for sure. I definitely think it is one that we used to study in school. You used to study the Mayflower Compact in school. They, they don't study that anymore. In fact, right. it's very rarely talked about anymore when we talk about the Mayflower and the pilgrims. Um, the, the Mayflower Compact is kind of an afterthought to the Thanksgiving story, which is, you know, what we know um, probably so well in popular culture today, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about that relationship with the Native Americans, because I also kind of feel like um, we teach it incorrectly. Uh, you know, we teach it now, I think, more that the Native Americans saved the pilgrims. When I, when I, uh, my understanding is it was very a mutual, mutually benefit agreement. Um, so you have Somerset, he comes in looking for, I think he was looking for alcohol actually, when he saw that there was a settlement there. And he spoke a little bit of English and he spoke English because another misconception I think is that, you know, this is the first time Europeans are setting foot on this land. That's not, not true at all. Right. We, we no. know that the French have been up in Nova Scotia. We know that the English had fishing, you know, settlements that they'd come and fish for a season and leave. And we know from Squanto that the Spaniards had been there as well. Mm -hmm. So, so the native Americans had, had clearly known who the Europeans were. Uh, the, the fact that Somerset yeah. speaks a little bit of English knows that, okay, they, they've, they've been here before. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I think is really interesting is you, you talk about the Patuxic and the, and what they call the great dying, the plague that went through the great dying mm -hmm. and everything. And the, mm -hmm. the Nar Narganset and the Nosset tribe, well, the Nosset tribe had already built up immunity to that, those plagues because they had been dealing with the Europeans for, like you said, a century. So they kind of had that immunity and they were using that immunity as kind of a spiritual, um, I want to say like a spiritual check mark, checkmate against the Wampanoag who didn't have that kind of immunity yet. And they were dealing with that in their confederacy and their um, uh, group as they were now being exposed to those kind of diseases that they had never been exposed to before. Um, so we see Somerset come in and he introduced a member to Squantum or what we probably know more as Squanto. Okay. So right. Let's talk a little bit about Squanto because I think his life was really, really fascinating. And it's one that, you know, he's kind of a blip in the story, but he has a very interesting story. So I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Squanto and kind of what we know about him or what you know about him. If, if yeah. you don't mind. Well, one thing is a, 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 a lot of people, uh, believe that Squanto, they, they, they conflate Squanto and, and Samoset. They, they, yeah. they, they think that they, they, one does something and they think the other one did it. And it's because it, Samoset really, he was an Abenaki, he was from the Abenaki tribe up in Maine and he was down visiting or whatever, but he, he spoke English because of all of the, uh, the exposure he had to the ship captains and the sea people that were trading and doing stuff. So he had learned some broken English. He wasn't as proficient as Squanto was. In fact, he comes in and you know, and they say he, uh, it was, it was, uh, uh, the 16th of March. He said, a certain Indian came boldly amongst us and spoke to us in broken English, which we could well understand, but marveled at it. Mm -hmm. At length, we understood by discourse with him that he was not from these parts, but belonging to the Northern parts where some English ships came to fish. And so he goes on 
and, and Bradford talks about that. And then he says, but uh, he then introduces us to Squanto, who was a native of this place and could speak better English than himself. And Bradford calls Squanto a, an instrument sent of God for our good beyond our expectations. That was his. He directed us how to set our corn and where to take fish and where to procure other commodities and, and was a was a pilot to bring us to un, unknown places for our profit and never left us till he died. Uh, he, go, he goes on to talk about what he did for them. The one thing I found most amazing about Squanto's story is not that he, the, the fact that he was, he knew such good English because he had lived among the English. He was taken as a, he was taken on a ship uh, by Thomas Hunt and taken over to Spain to be sold as a slave. Mm -hmm. But the, some friars over there, uh, there was some obscure law from 1562 the Spanish had that says you couldn't enslave Native American people. So they pulled that out and got him released. And he ended up going over to England. And he lived over in England for about six years. I mean, for, uh, I don't want to, I can't recall exactly how many, years, but a while. He lived over there yeah. for a few years in London. And then he, uh, and in fact, he may have crossed paths with uh, with Shakespeare, who was, you know, living in England at that time, because he was he was a Native American. And he lived with Slaney, one of these prominent people. He wasn't just, uh, uh, you know, a homeless person living on the streets. He was he was a very uh, prominent person. He learned, and he comes old comes back to uh, with uh, Sir Sir Ferdinando Gorges, who was this. Uh, one who comes along and, and is, is influential in the establishing of, of uh, settlements along the northern parts of, of, the, of New England exactly. or of North America. And uh, so he comes back and makes his way back to Plymouth. And so, so he comes back and he speaks pretty good English. And the thing that, you know, as much as Bradford, I'm going to just say this for your viewers who might not know this, but, but um, you know, we, we have, Squanto's a lot of books written about Squanto, what a great guy Squanto was, and all this. Squanto was a little bit diabolical in a sense, and he got himself in big trouble with the Massasoit. Yes, yeah, because he uh, he basically uh, was playing them against. He was telling them that you know the English they have this 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 the, the plague that we've all experienced that they keep it buried underground and they've got it and they can bring it out at any time. So you need me to sort of be your you know, I'll keep things going good with them, but you start providing tributes to me instead of Massasoit. And so he was like, he was basically accused by Massasoit of treason and insisted that the pilgrims turn him over to be executed for, uh, that was part of the treaty. So the yeah. pilgrims actually kind of were violating the treaty by, they, they were putting off trying to do this because he was so valuable to them as a translator and, yeah. and a liaison to these native tribes. He did, they, they were trying to convince me. So isn't there another way we could punish him or, yeah. <laughs> you know, but it's really an interesting story because uh, uh, I've always thought who doesn't, the Indian who doesn't get quite the, the uh, appreciation, not Massasoit was, was wonderful, but uh, Habamak was another one who came and lived with him. He was a, a Panis who was a, a, a warrior, but also a very wise man and in, in, in there, culture and in their tribe and he actually lived outside Plymouth Plantation lived with them and he became he he was the one that that over the long term was was a really important person I think from from the benefit that the pilgrims had from it and really appreciated him because I didn't really realize realize this for a long time but Squanto died in 1622 Bradford says until he died you know he was uh, but that was like a year and a half later. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and of course, this was all on the heels of Massasoit, one, Massasoit wanting to uh, you know, execute justice, uh, Native American justice on his, his uh, um, what do you call it, uh, sedition or, uh, you know, what he was guilty of. Because they I think, uh, the death penalty. And I think some they, think they was actually, you know, um, I was going to say, yes, I was going to say, I think that um, many people believe he was actually poisoned. Well, that's right. When he died, because it, it came on so suddenly and it yeah. was right, bleeding from the nose and, and but he knew he was dying and he gave, uh, 
he he gave some of his things to some of his English friends who he had because he knew because he knew he was passing it, and he he dies in in the fall of sixteen twenty two. So he's and it's almost like, gee, how did that how did that happen? You man? know, and here's he's got the thing. second died suddenly. <laughs> so I did a whole video on King Philip's War. Ooh. Okay, so who's yeah. Massasoit's son? Well, yeah. the oldest son dies very mysteriously like that in the same way and king philip actually references the death of squanto thinking that that his brother had been poisoned in the same manner Uh, yeah that's where that's where that that's where that uh comes from in terms of where we think that that may have been it's kind of like the speedwell we were talking about the speedwell coming over most people think, well, it was just on water. You know, the Speedwell ended up being a fine, no problem with that ship. What they, even Bradford suspected, if you read up Plymouth Plantation, he says, he makes the claim that he thinks they, they uh, uh, sabotaged the boat. They, they were, yeah. the, the seamen didn't want to go over on that small boat. Maybe if they'd been on the Mayflower, they, they'd have gone, they would have, they would have gone happily, but uh, in fact, even when the Mayflower was having trouble halfway over, they debated whether to turn around and go back because there, there were some of the seamen who, who, who you know, didn't want to do that. But, but they sabotaged by taking over overpressing the ship with sails, brought water on it, and and it gives the same symptoms that if it's leaking or something. So, mm. they, the fact that it did it three times as they tried to leave and they they go back and tar it and put all this stuff and they'd go back out and it still was taken on water. So it was, a, again, an intentional type thing. Yeah. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is I, I want to talk about Massasoit because Massasoit ends up living for quite a long time. He yeah. um, he does quite, I think he lives into his 80s. He li- outlives Bradford. Yeah. he's Yeah. And they do live for, for quite a long time and they do form a really interesting relationship. And I, I kind of want to ex- explore that with you and talk about yeah. that first introduction, what that first thanksgiving really was like and what that partnership between massasoit and and bradford were what was like well that's a great topic too because uh and, and again i've uh, i've heard I, i've i'm a member of the mayflower society and we had we hosted the general congress in delaware a number of years ago when i was younger and one of the orators from the Poconoka tribe, Paul Whedon, was our guest speaker. He came down and talked about it. And he shared some things that got me thinking. And I didn't realize, and you wouldn't read it anywhere because they didn't, they didn't write a lot of this stuff. They don't write, uh, that was not their tradition to write things down. They passed orally. They they made sure somebody in their tribe was gifted in that. And, and they would have them learn it and then be able to repeat it. But he made the, the comment that... Um, uh, he thought that when when they got made that treaty, I mean, they came down and he said there were like 90 braves on the other side of the hill there that were all ready to come. Down. If this didn't go well, they were just going to wipe them out. And just, it, 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 you know, it's like do it, do it now and do it quick. And, but he also mentioned that there was they were a very spiritual people. They were. In fact, um, Veronzano, the explorer, had had met that tribe years ago and referred to them as the praying Indians. And they were they they and Paul Whedon was sharing how Massasoit did notice something different about there was some. It wasn't just that they had children and they had their families there, but there was something in the character of of Winslow and Brewster and Bradford, and there was something about them that. He felt a connection, and I believe again it's the Holy Spirit working in the, in the. It could have been working in the lives of all of these people because it was something that providentially came together that was a unique relationship. But the thing that really cemented that relationship was when, because of because of the the business we were talking about with Squanto, mm-hmm. and and they defied Squanto. They were basically breaking the treaty by not turning him back over for for. In fact, they said. Massasoit sends him his knife to cut off his his hands and his head and send it back to him to, to, to do it, to execute that judgment. Because we we agreed, the pilgrims agreed that if somebody warred against you, we would we would support you. And so this was an internal war, but it's like, and you're you're 
letting him stay there. You're you're harboring him in a sense. So he was not happy with with the pilgrims at that point. He didn't say a whole lot, but a lot of his visits, communication was dwindling down, and it was getting to be, you know, what's going to happen here? Well, wouldn't you know it? And says, so it gets ill, gets deathly ill, and to the point where all of the all of his tribes leaders, the sachems from all the different tribes, were coming up to pay their respects because he was all he had all the symptoms and he was he was going to be gone shortly. And so Plymouth leadership says, well, we need to go up and pay our respects as well too. We we should do that as well. So Winslow and uh, and Habermach and a visitor from England named John Hammond, the three of them, just the three of them, go up through the wood, go up and visit um, Massasoit. And Winslow ends up treating him. He's, he's got these symptoms and he, he does all, he, it's described in Mort's relation and it's really not for the queasy or the faint of heart. He scrapes yeah. furred, his furred tongue and he talks about all this stuff he does and he makes this sassafras stuff that he, he feeds it to him. And, he ends up reviving and comes back to life. And then he, then he, then he overdoes it. And he wants, wants Winslow to make him some stuff, some of this stuff that he's made him before. And he makes it and he, and he doesn't do a little, eat a little bit of it. He go, gorges it and then he go, gets real sick again. And they think, Oh no, he's, we're going to lose him. <laughs> but, but they end up, he ends up reviving before they leave. And uh, master so it, is able to he see again he lost his sight he can see again he's 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 recovered in the time that brett or winslow's there and he asked winslow if he'll go and treat several others that had the same symptoms and winslow agrees to do it he didn't want to do it but he, you know yeah i'll help him so when he goes to leave massasoit tells all of the sachems that are there to to wish him you know give him their final you know thing he says now i know the english are my friends and love me and whilst i live i shall never forget the kindness they have showed me he's telling that to all his sachems and he's also telling them he also before winslow leaves he says there's a um a, an assault brewing that i'm aware of i've been asked to be a part of i'm on i want to let you know about again as part of that treaty he's reestablishing that treaty mm -hmm. to say he not only t warns them that there are uh, the Massachusetts and the uh, the not the Nosset, they're they're different tribes that are going to converge on you. They want to take out this this one of Weston's new settlements up there that's been that's been a thorn in the side of Plymouth, but also the thorn in the side of the tribes. And but they feel like if they wipe those people out, or or then because they're English, that Plymouth will come and support them. So they're planning to wipe out Plymouth at the same time. And Massasoit tells them that. He says, you go back, tells Winslow, and says, you go you go back and tell Winslow and tell Bradford, not only that warn them, but he says, and here's what you need to do about it. Here's what, here's what will fix. You need, there are six, you know, there were seven people that were involved. You need to kill these people and, 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 and it'll send the message. And everything will be fine. Trust me. So he's get, telling them what he needs to do. And they wrestled with this back at Plymouth. They're going, wait a minute, we just can't go in. You know, we don't have, we don't have, we just have his word. We don't have any, and of course, being good biblical people, they're saying it has to be on the, uh, in, in with, with three witnesses or something like that. Well, wouldn't you know it, somebody else comes into the to the thing and, and warns them of the same thing. Hey, there, there's guys that are coming to, to, they're, they're, there's a warlike thing going on here. I just want to warn you. And finally, one other guy escaped from West Augusta and came down, and he comes running in, and he tells them. So in the in the three witnesses, they, they're going, you know what? You don't have to tell us four times. We're, we're going to – this is – we got to trust our friend, Mrs. So, so they go up and preemptively take out these – several people it was it was less than 10 it was like seven people and and sure enough everybody got the message and peace was maintained and and massasoit was good to his word he he never he was the one that even in you know his sons would look back and say my father was too was too yeah he, he stuck to uh their friendship he was too good a friend to them 
mm-hmm. than, than they deserve because because of that 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 saving their life and that, that that relationship that was very special that they had developed. And I think and I think it's a shame most people don't know that. When you when they yeah. learn that, that 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 happened, all this talk of oh, all they wanted to do was kill them all and wipe them off and they they, they, they their intention was genocide, finish them all off, take their land, steal from them, and all that sort of stuff. That would be the antithesis of what their faith told them to do. It's inconceivable that that's, that makes any sense at all if you know these people and who they were. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing that, that drives me. It's like you, you got to know who they are to understand what they did and how God used this. And if you don't have a biblical right. worldview, it, it makes no sense to you. Yeah, one of uh, Met Comet or Philip, one of his grievances was that his father sold too much of their land to the English and that there was, there was that kind of money exchange and he didn't, he didn't like that. He didn't think his father should have done that. Yeah. You know, so it wasn't just the English stealing land. I mean, a lot of it they bought from the native Americans. And I think a lot of people don't realize realize that, that. Um, you know, no, a lot of those agreements were not, done in good faith but well, yeah sure. you know but they but they but many of them especially the pilgrims they they did try to do right by the native americans and i and i think um i think they don't get enough credit for that yeah uh the jeremy bangs who just recently passed away who's done a lot of research uh he's he was an amazing historian and bringing together a lot of what went on in leiden and a lot of uh plymouth history um he he has uh, one of the, his contributions is, is a book I just got, uh, you know, last year on Indian deeds, the, mm-hmm. the, the, the whole, all of the, he had gone through, he'd, he'd spent a lot of time going back through it because they, they kept really good records up there because they needed to, they'd have people coming and say, well, I bought this land. Or they, they, they'd make an arrangement and then somebody else would come. No, that was my land. Now you, you, you need to pay me too. And it's like, wait a minute, we gotta, we gotta document this stuff. <laughs> we gotta, yeah. we gotta who, who, we don't want to pay for it five or five times from different people who claim that it's their land. Um, so yeah, it was, there was going to be some that were not on the up and up, but uh, they had the court system that the, that the uh, native Americans were, if it involved Plymouth plantation, they, they had a court system that was set to be set up to be a justice system that would, that would apply to native Americans. A lot of people don't realize that, um, that uh, there was there were three guys from Plymouth uh, in 1637, I think it was 1630, after the Pequot War, that actually had waylaid some guy who uh, Arthur Peach was the was the guy from Plymouth. <clears throat> he was a servant, and there were two other pe- uh, three others: Daniel Cross, uh, Richard Stinnings, and uh, Robert ja- um, or Thomas Jackson. There were four of them that were there, and they they waylaid this, this Indian and, and Pete stabbed him and yep. they, they took his stuff and, but he got away and Roger Williams got involved in it and they, they ended up, he ended up dying. And so they charged him with murder mm-hmm. and they convicted them of murder and all three of them hung in Plymouth because they, they waylaid this, this native American. So to think that, you wouldn't do that if your goal is to wipe them all out and you don't care about their life. They treat them like animals. All this narrative that you hear is just like, no, read some history. Yeah. This is a promotion for history. Go out and learn some history. Know what happened before you start jumping on these, uh, you know, bandwagons that, that don't well, really you know, and a understand lot of the, what happened and why. A lot of these Native Americans, as I've been doing this research, uh, pledged their loyalty to either the French or the English and became essentially French and English citizens. Mm. Um, you know, that's how King Philip becomes King Philip. They, they pledge their loyalty to the crown of England, the King of England. And um, that's right. Though some would say they these... didn't know what they were doing. They were right. You know, I, yeah. The implications of it. And that there may be some, some truth to that, but it, they still were, were loyal allies because mm-hmm. they, they also had their quarrels with other tribes that they 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 wanted yeah. the support of, of of the English because they had some weapons and they had gunpowder and things that um, 
Yeah, and it's true too. And I think I I was talking to somebody, um, I think we in today's modern um, 21st century viewpoint, we kind of lump the Native Americans in as one people, right? Like, oh, Native Americans. But the Abnaki had totally different traditions, customs as the Catawba in South Carolina. I mean, Mm -hmm. These were not necessarily the same people. It, that would be like saying, oh, those were just the Europeans. But the Europeans were not, you know, together on a lot of things. You had the French and, you know, yeah. the, and I would say that that's kind of the same thing with the Native Americans. Absolutely. The Native Americans had their own interests. They had their own traditions. They had their own customs. I think in one of the videos I did, we had to discuss what morning rites were. And not every tribe participated in that, but some of them did, which they would replace their fallen warriors with either kidnapped sure. Europeans or kidnapped Native Americans and entered into some kind of form of servitude and slavery. Uh, but not every tribe did that. But and it was not uncommon. That's not that was a very common thing to do. That's a, right. You know, that's how right. they subdued a nation. They would they would take them in and, and raise them as their own. Yeah, that was yeah. So, but yeah, but this has been such a great conversation. And normally I do these for an hour. We've gone over that hour. So well, well, <laughs> I, I've, I, I've really enjoyed this. And I, I didn't want to stop you guys because I was learning so much. Well, and, I, you know, I, I just, I really appreciate both of you from coming on. Aaron, sorry about the, I know you kind of kept popping in I and out there. I'm tonight. I'm yes. sorry to you, Aaron. I was hoping you'd. You well, know. thanks. So much good to share, and I feel like I, I, I guess, dominated this thing. No, well, I guess I guess I'm just struck to you by the 50 year peace treaty. Talk about treaties between individual groups, yes, and individual relationships. And Lisa, I'm so grateful that we we're able to explore further the relationship between two individuals on behalf of their people, and what a profound impact that made. And then I think when you look at world history, the norm is for, pe- for treaties to be broken. Mm-hmm. And um, it's kind of like an uneasy piece, but the, the norm tends to be, uh, again, when you have war and you have rumors of war. And so I know it's in a different context, but I'm so grateful for this tonight because it was in the context of that first winter when half their number died. And Bradford described how at times there'd only be perhaps three or four who are still sound enough to take care of others and right. to change their clothing and to feed them and to care for them. And by doing so displayed an example of Christian love and compassion. But he said, it's a rare example and worthy to be remembered. And so I'm so grateful with this Thanksgiving season. We've had this conversation tonight. I know I was flitting in and out, but just to remember uh, what happened and to remember what our country was really built upon, the foundations. And on the 200 year anniversary, the bicentennial of the landing at Plymouth Rock, Daniel Webster stood at Plymouth Rock and he gave this oration. And he identified a number of those themes that we touched on tonight, like how the pilgrims embodied faith and family and freedom and how this tiny misfit band of people who did not have much status, you could say a band of immigrants uh, people who weren't from here originally, they came here and they embodied those principles. And so in America, we're not founded on who your father was, we're founded on the idea of what those ideals are. And yet, even Bradford himself said, after they crossed over the ocean and there's that vast bar that separated them from their home, and they were thinking that they would perish, Bradford said, may not and ought not our children rightly say that our fathers were Englishmen and crossed over this vast ocean and cried out to the Lord and he heard them and he delivered them. Uh, I'm paraphrasing that, but just that idea that you can be proud of who you are, you can be proud of where you came from. Again, the pilgrims were proud, but they were Englishmen. And yet that's part of what makes our country today. So I just can't think of more inspiring history that we didn't sugarcoat tonight. Um, I'm grateful that we're able to accurately tell um, even again, thinking of how the pilgrims did maybe not keep their end of the deal with Massasoit and with Squanto, but um, I, I, I know I've been inspired by this conversation, and I think that too, when you look at what's happening in our country, 
we see such division taking place and we see the dehumanization of people and saying, oh, well, your color of skin is this. So they make up these assumptions. We've been able to look at individuals and look at accurate history of what happened. And um, it's just such a wondrous time of year and it's pretty able to share. So again, thank you for bearing with me, but I enjoyed every part I got to hear. And, and we said, again, thank you so much for the individual passengers that you've been highlighting on your channel and for all the incredible work you've been doing with sharing this very little known history. I yeah. think if anything, people might think they know, they might think they know the first Thanksgiving and think it's a caricature and then dismiss it or say it's all a lie. But to be able to distinguish, well, there is truth to this, but then here are things that we don't know. And there's such a history, rich history that we have to continue to explore. Yeah. So again, I just can't thank you enough. Well, thank well, you. Yeah, Thanksgiving, thank you Thanksgiving also was a, you know, it was a three day celebration uh, where they feasted and entertained and feasted and shot their arms. They played games and did things. So it, it was a, it wasn't just a one time thing, and it didn't happen year after year after year. It just happened that that one time. But I just like to, I just like to end, I guess, with the with Bradford's probably his most famous quote because it it kind of wraps up, I think, too that. It's very prescient when you think about it. He said, as one small candle may light a thousand, so the light here kindled has shown unto many, yea, in some sort, to our whole nation. Let the glorious name of Jehovah have all the praise. And that uh, I think that captures it. One small candle. It's individual. It's individual freedom, individual liberty. and It's not, it's not group freedoms and group liberties. It's individual the individual is what makes us unique as a nation and uh, in our standing before men and before God. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for coming on here. I am going to have all your links in the bio. So if go follow Aaron Liberty Encounters, his website is down there. You can find him on Instagram and Facebook. And then go check out the 16... 20 experience.com. Yeah. .com. Okay. And yeah. make sure you like and subscribe. And I will see you guys on the next history hour. Thank you so much, Lisa. Bye. Appreciate it.